Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 523, your weekly Corona update. The numbers are as follows for today, December 13th, 2020. Worldwide infected, 72.5 million. United States infected, 16.5 million. Worldwide deaths, 1.6 million. U.S. deaths, 305.6 thousand. By the way, these are going up so fast in the U.S. that if I do my research and I write the show, you know, like a day ahead of time and stuff, I have to readjust the numbers because in that 24-hour period of time, there is actually a noticeable difference in deaths, which is pretty crazy. That's kind of hitting new levels for us. In fact, in the U.S. here, we have now topped more than 3,000 daily deaths without really any indication that this is going to be going downhill, though we are, at least a lot of places are, currently on some lockdowns that will hopefully help that out. But as of right now, man, whoo, 3,000 plus daily deaths. That is fucking crazy. And of course, we've been talking about those other numbers like serious infections, where the U.S. is at 27,500, as well as active cases, where we're at 6.5 million, just leading the world at one of the worst statistics. Because again, when you look at overall deaths, a lot of these places had you know high overall deaths, but they have gone down, or they're at least on the downswing. We talked about Belgium the other day. They had they had the highest per capita deaths of any place in the world for a lot of different reasons. Now it has gone way, way down. They hit their peak and they're going down. We are climbing uphill. We have not hit our peak. We have not flattened anything out. We're certainly not on the downturn yet. We are just trudging forward like somebody trying to conquer Everest. It's, uh, it's pretty crazy to be in the United States right now. Uh, on to the science articles for this week. Obviously, a Great piece of news. Pfizer's emergency vaccine approval was given by the FDA on the 11th of this month of December in 2020 for anybody who is 16 and up. And actually, one of the things, the holding points that people were talking about is whether or not they should give it to 16 and 17 year olds, weighing the relative risks of a vaccine that's gone through an expedited phase three trial and possible complications that could bring versus 16 and 17 year olds in general not having bad reactions. So there was actually some very interesting scientific discussion about the validity of whether or not you give it to 16 and 17 year olds. But in the end, they decided that that was a valid thing to do, that it would help not just those people, small numbers of which do have bad reactions, but also because those 16 and 17 year olds are then vectors towards other older people who can obviously get sick and die from it. So an interesting discussion by the FDA on why they finally approved it for 16 and up uh, with those 16 and 17 year olds being one of the sticking points, but they finally did do that on the 11th of this month. We are already seeing distribution in the UK because they approved it a bit earlier. And actually, after some strong allergic reactions seen in wider distributions in the UK that's going on right now, the FDA actually recommended that people with severe allergies don't take it in the first round. Those people who have severe anaphylaxis and stuff like that, they've recommended that those people avoid it in the first round of US distribution. So that's something to know if you're going to go out and get that. If you're somebody who does have severe anaphylaxic reactions to things like bee stings and penicillin and shellfish and stuff. Now, I don't know what their specifics are because right now they've just released severe anaphylaxis. So they haven't kind of narrowed that down to, you know, this specific thing makes you, uh, you're allergic to. But something to keep in mind. Now, those people in the UK that had the reaction, they're still alive. It's not like it killed them or anything. It's just something to keep in mind. There might be some components of it that are activating some people's extreme allergies. But then, even then, we're not saying, you know, if you're a little bit allergic to penicillin or you swell up really big with a bee sting or something, we're saying people with extreme anaphylactic reactions should hold off at least until the second round. So with that emergency authorization, 3 million doses shipped to the United States within 24 hours. And by the way, you know, we talked about how there'll be a two dose vaccine. So we're gonna have to need two of these. All 3 million of these will be the first dose. So they're sending 3 million now and they're gonna send 3 million as a follow up to be the second doses. So this is not split as one and a half million people. This will be three million people vaccinated likely by the end of this year in the United States with the Pfizer vaccine. Moderna's vaccine will be reviewed on the 17th of December 
And if it gets approved, what is which it is expected to, based on their phase three and phase two trial results, then 12 and a half million will be shipped immediately. Again, this is supposed to be first doses. And the idea is that we can get close to somewhere between 15 to 20 million people vaccinated, at least first dose vaccinated before the end of 2020, which will be great. That is fantastic. You know, it's not everybody, obviously, you know, you're talking about you know, seven or eight percent of the population. But if we and, and it's still only the first dose, we don't have the second one yet. But if we can start getting this ball rolling and work on a similar timeline, then there's no reason we can't have, you know, most of the people who want a vaccine and who can take it because they don't have severe allergic reactions or immunocompromisation or something like that. There's no reason we can't get all of those people to have at least one of these vaccines halfway through 2021. So really promising results so far. Very interesting discussion going on, though, especially when it comes to Moderna, is do we vaccinate people in the control groups for these studies? So obviously, you know, phase three, we publish the results, but we keep watching people who are in phase three for a long period of time, sometimes a year or two, to see if there's any long term effects. And so there's this very interesting discussion going on that all those people who got the control, you know, the placebo group for these studies, should we then now when they become available, give them the vaccine itself to protect them because we need to protect people, right? Well, there's this argument that like, no, we can't because then we can't tell long-term effects versus a control group. And there's the other argument of, hey, are you trying to do Tuskegee again? Like we need to get these people something that's going to save lives. It's not fair to not give it to them just to be like some weird science experiment. And then there's the, you know, the rebuttal of, yeah, but that weird science experiment might end up saving more lives in the end and blah, 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 back and forth. So very interesting, like science ethics discussion going on right now as to what to do with control groups in these Moderna and Pfizer studies and when to finally give them the vaccine because eventually you know you're gonna have to like do you do this a year from now after those results come in two years from now do you do it as soon as it's available what do you do with these people very very interesting ethical question and I can actually see both sides of this argument it's not a black and white issue because frankly the knowledge that we gain from those people which each one of those groups would be about 20,000 people each one of the controls one for Pfizer one for Moderna those 40,000 altogether people have a right you know to be safe and to to live in a safe environment, especially because right now they don't even know if they got the vaccine yet. It's, it's a blind group. They don't know if they got a vaccine, if they got a placebo. So they have a right to be protected, just like the rest of us do. But also them signing up for that specific trial, they agreed to, you know, possibly be a 50-50 chance to be in a control group. And if they are in a control group, then we need that control group to see what the long-term health effects are for the rest of us. So it is this really, really interesting, like scientific ethical dilemma. By the way, an interesting thing that came out in the reviews for FDA is that in some of the clinical trials, individuals that were in the placebo group actually had COVID antibodies suggesting that they had previously been infected, you know, whether they were mild or asymptomatic and didn't know it or whatever. Basically, when they took their blood and they did the testing and stuff, they they realized that before they gave them the placebo, they had antibodies indicative of SARS-CoV-2. And then some percentage of those people who had those antibodies still ended up getting sick with SARS-CoV-2 later on, because again, they were in the placebo group, which reinforces the idea that we've talked about that naturally acquired COVID immunity may not always be very long lasting because it looks like just like we talked about before about people getting it more than once. These people looks like at least if we're not, you know, mistaking these antibodies for a common cold coronavirus antibody, it looks like these people in these studies can we can show have also gotten it multiple times. So it will be interesting to see how long that lasts, what the factors are that determine whether or not somebody gets reinfected or not. Really, really interesting. That comes to the question of when we can actually stop doing the whole masks and distancing and stuff. Now, it wouldn't be right away, and we still need to see exactly what happens in terms of how immune or resistant you are to the disease. Because remember, we say 95% effectiveness in stopping the disease, but that's in terms of symptomatic cases because of the asymptomatic ones weren't tested. And also there's the issue of like, well, we're still in lockdown and a certain amount of people did get sick, right? And so will that change when everybody gets out uh, and they're running around and breathing and not wearing masks? Will that effectiveness go down, et cetera, et cetera? And then, you know, this isn't all done as a clinical study. And so things get less effective as they go into regular doctor's offices and stuff. So it will be interesting to see that. What are the recommendations? Do we still wear masks? Do we still distance even after you get the shot for a while? And again, remember, the second you get the shot, you still need a second shot. And then you still need to kind of wait a while for your immune system to catch up. So the question at hand will be, how does this work in terms of how we phase back into reality, the reality that we knew before? All right, article number two, a new oral drug can stop transmission of the virus within 24 hours. This is amazing news. I don't know why this wasn't on the cover of like every 
wrestling news site around. This is the biggest, COVID's the biggest news story of the year, biggest news story of the decade. And this is one of the biggest untold COVID news stories. I don't know why this is more of a deal. But anyway, there's an antiviral drug called MK4482 or malnupiravir. And it essentially seems to completely suppress transmission of the virus in our animal models. So the drug is still in three phase three trials. We haven't actually released a bunch of stuff with humans yet, but it was originally developed to suppress the flu virus, which is a great idea. Obviously, flu kills a lot of people and suppression of it is great, but it's showing amazing effectiveness against SARS-CoV-2. And unlike drugs that show some effectiveness like remdesivir, which I know is kind of controversial. We talked before about some studies showing it works, some some showing it doesn't and not nearly as effective. Remdesivir, remember we talked about as an IV medication, you have to get it done in a hospital. This is an oral medication, which means you don't have to be in a hospital. It's much more effective than remdesivir. You can just, you know, give people a bunch of prescriptions to take it home. And in at least in the studies that were done that were released this week that were done in ferrets who usually readily pass on SARS-CoV-2, it stopped them passing it on. It also stopped really bad cases and seemed to basically stop the progression of the disease. And in order to test it, they took infected ferrets and they put them in cages with uninfected parrots. The ones that had the drug and were in the cage with uninfected ferrets, even in these super confined close quarters, none of the uninfected ferrets got sick. And in the control groups, all of the co-housed ferrets got sick because again, highly transmissible, et cetera, et cetera. So not only does it help stop the disease from becoming severe and kind of stop it in its tracks, it also stops within 24 hours the production of it in your respiratory tract to the degree that you can pass it on to other people, at least if this, again, you know, this is an animal model, if this holds true in human models, this is amazing. I mean, I don't know how quickly the FDA would release something like this as like an emergency use. And let's see what the phase three says when it comes out and everything. But this would be a game changer because this means that, you know, if you do regular testing, you see somebody who's sick, you get this to them quick enough and you could essentially cut out the time frame in which they are infectious to other people. You can knock that quarantine time down to 24 hours. This would be great. Uh, Hopefully this doesn't have negative side effects and it's readily available and it's not too expensive and we can get it out to people who need it, et cetera, et cetera. But if we could... And if we could start production on this very quickly, that would be a game changer. Article number three why children aren't getting sick. So this is interesting. We've talked about this. Obviously, everybody knows that the disease seems to affect old people more with the exception of that Kawasaki-like syndrome we see in certain kids. Most of the deaths are not seen in children. Some are, but most are not. And we talked before a couple of months ago about how the younger the kids are, the less they seem affected. So under 12 is way less effective than 12 to 15, which is, you know, less affected than 15 to 19. So why is that? We think it's actually a compilation of different ideas. So there's a few things. One is kids tend to have a more specific T cell response, the T cells in their immune system. It's not that they have more because actually we find out that oftentimes adults have more, but we have two types of T cells. We have memory T cells and naive T cells. Memory T cells are things that are in your body that uh, essentially have a biochemical signature of a specific pathogen that they're ready to attack. Whereas naive T cells don't, and those are looking at things more broadly. Adults have a bigger overall reaction usually to SARS-CoV-2, but too many of those are memory T cells that don't quite have SARS-CoV-2's number for the most part, but naive T cells do. And basically what kids send out is almost all naive T cells. So that looks really like a really interesting possibility that they're immediately quelling this infection really, really fast because they're not wasting a bunch of, you know, memory T cells going after something they're not going to be able to fight. And kids in general tend to have a more robust response to novel infections than adults because again we're so used to going through the world with our memory t cells and with a built-up immune system that's already refight stuff that we are great at fighting things we've already gotten before but we're not nearly as good at fighting new things because a lot of time unless you know it's similar to something we've gotten before because those kids immune systems all they do is fight new stuff so that is what they are better at then we found out and talked before about how kids have less of those ACE2 receptors in their nasal passageways, and that is where SARS-CoV-2 binds to. So if there's less receptors, there's less places for them to enter the body, and even if you do get infected, it's like getting infected with a lower dose, and we've talked before about how, you know, viral load, how many actual copies of the virus infect you in the beginning is a huge impact on whether or not you get really sick or not. 
In addition, some new research coming out this week shows that children's immune systems actually tend to go after the spike protein only. So they're attacking just that ACE2 spike protein, while adults' immune systems will go after the spike protein, but they also go after these specific elements called nucleocaspid proteins. And these are made after the virus has done a lot of damage. It's infected a bunch, it's busted open a bunch of cells and, you know, repeated a bunch of copies of itself, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems like our immune system takes a while to catch up because a a lot of it is focused on elements of the disease that only come later on, you know, after we're getting really infected and then we have a huge response. Whereas the children's immune system seems deadly focused with naive T cells right on those ACE2 spike proteins. And so they're just better at this particular illness at fighting it off more quickly. All right, and last article, very interesting one about the Australian vaccine. So the vaccine that was developed in Australia has been going through trials in Australia itself, and they've had to halt it this week because the vaccine causes false positives on HIV tests. This is really interesting. Now, I want to clarify in case you've heard some rumors or anything like this does not cause HIV. It cannot cause HIV. It has nothing to do with HIV itself. But here's why this is interesting. They actually had to stop the entire production of this vaccine. They're probably gonna have to go to a different vaccine. They're gonna go to, you know, a Pfizer vaccine or a Moderna or something because some of these recipients are actually testing positive for HIV, even though they don't have HIV. The reason is in making this vaccine, they actually use segments of an HIV protein to stabilize this vaccine. And again, can't give you HIV or in any way directly harm you. But the body's response in creating antibodies to this also creates responses that trigger false positives on HIV tests. Not all in all people, but it can trigger false positives on HIV tests. So you might say, what's the problem? I mean, if they're not getting HIV, they're just getting false positives. What's the problem? Well, here's the problem. If they vaccinate everybody in Australia with one of these and all of a sudden HIV tests are unreliable, then this could lead to a totally different epidemic in this country where we are essentially unable to effectively identify HIV infections, which would lead to an HIV outbreak in Australia. This is really interesting. It would completely take out our testing mechanism for being able to quickly identify and then quash HIV breakouts within the population. This is really interesting. I had never even thought about this before, which is that even if, you know, testing positive for exposure to HIV was just a false positive, you'd think, oh, yeah, you know, just ignore it. No, you can't because this, our testing mechanism is part of the way we keep an epidemic from spreading. You have to be able to test a bunch of people and say, oh, this guy's got HIV. Let's call him up and tell him, you know, you're not allowed to have unprotected sex anymore. But if you can't do that, then all of a sudden there's no signal to noise ratio and you have no idea who does or doesn't have HIV and you have a whole different problem on your hands. Really interesting science. All right. Thank you, audience, for joining me this week on Science Faction 523, where you learned all about Pfizer's new vaccine approval an oral drug that can stop transmission of SARS-CoV-2 within 24 hours, why children aren't getting sick as much as adults, and how the Australian vaccine won't give you HIV, but is still dangerous enough in its own right to make us stop using it. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back later this week for Science Faction 524. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. 